I'm John Courtney. I'm a Quaker. Um, I'm a member of the Occupy Economics Working Group, and in on the grounds of transparency, I'm the prospective parliamentary candidate for the Labour Party in the Bromley Chitterhurst constituency. I'm talking <coughs> in a personal capacity, but part of my personal capacity is that I'm a cooperator. I'm the chair of the Cooperative Party in Bromley, and the labelling of foods and the fact you've got fair trade food in your shop is purely and simply because the co-op did it first. Yeah. Tesco's and Sainsbury's would have never done it. Um, my question is about the alternative to TTIP because in the 1990s I worked with Barry Coates who was then director of WDM and with Tyson Alexander and other civil society act actors to get rid of the Multilateral Agreement <coughs> on Investment, MAI. I don't know if anybody remembers that. This is, the, this is the MAI moment, because I'm also a Canadian citizen as well as a UK subject. And as a Canadian, I can tell you that TTIP and all these other acronyms are the same as the North American Free Trade Agreement, mm -hmm. and they are pernicious. Mm -hmm. They are utterly pernicious. Mm -hmm. They are designed purely and simply to maintain capitalism's control over all of the people, including those people who support capitalism and the planet. And the Conservative Party and the Liberal Democratic Party, because I love our brothers to bits because I'm a Quaker and a Christian, <laughs> I'm afraid they are supporting this because that's what their funders, the European multinational corporations, want. They want to be able to compete on a world stage with the bleached chickens and the GMO food and the prophesized National Health Service. I don't talk about privatized. So, here's, here's my question. Once we have stopped TTIP, because we will, once we have stopped TTIP, what will the candidates do to increase the amount of income equality within Europe, given that TTIP will increase income inequality and given that the Spirit Level book tells us that income equality is the one good thing for health of people and planet that we need to be aiming at. So my question again to reiterate it, I'm a South East London school teacher so I talk too much, <laughs> <laughs> is will the candidates tell us what they will do if they are elected as European members of the European Parliament? What will they do to increase income equality <coughs> within Europe as a beacon for the rest of the world. Whoa. <laughs> Great question, which segues up into the post-trade there as well. So That's sort of work in, in the, the line of the question. Fantastic. Yeah. My name is Jackie. I run a, a, a small farm for 25 years. Um, in view of the fact that climate change is rushing in on us, uh, we learned recently that the Western Antarctic ice sheet is collapsing, and that means uh, uh, inevitably a one meter rise in sea level, and behind that there are many more glaciers, um, which are going to add when they melt to the rising sea levels. Um, I'd like to ask each candidate what their, how, much their, how much weight their own party puts on the environment in the battle between the big multinational corporations who are out for profit and national governments who we hope will be rather more on the side of the people. Good, good question. Thank you very much. Yeah. We've been moving gradually into the trade and other things, so do feel free to be a bit more transparent. Any other questions at this point? Because there are a couple of small votes to put here as well. Okay. Sure. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Wait for the next time, people. Okay. Any further questions on trade? What's it in now? In the picture? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name's. I don't need to stand there. So it's all right. Thank you. Well, there's no compulsion now. Right. Um, the, 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 the Conservative councilman, I um, can't remember your name, he said, What's the problem with a big deal? Um, in, I would answer that with the title of a James Bond movie, The World Is Not Enough. <laughs> and for these corporations, 
it's, it becomes transparently clear that the world is not enough. They, um, as our Labour candidate um, said, um, why wouldn't, or was it, was it the Tory gentleman, why wouldn't corporations want to sue national governments? Um, do we want corporations to be our world? If we want corporations to be our world, and if, if everybody here thinks it's some happy mishap, which is a, which is a strange um, oxymoron, isn't it? Um, that everybody, for one person, has voted more basically against CTIP. Um, what the, the reason for that is the people here, they understand CTIP. They understand the implications of TTIP. We are an informed audience. So what we need, I would, my question is, if, do, don't we need to inform everybody outside this room, all of us being a microcosm of, of what the rest of the world should know, should understand, and then how would anybody in their right mind allow TTIP to go through. Um, John, uh, congratulations to the BBC Student Congress of the Republic um, I was like I campaigned on the other week. Um, very active local party. Good. How do we increase uh, uh, um, uh, the financial inequality? This is, I think, this is the number one issue yep. that we face um, uh, overall. Um, and it's easy for me to say that, but what do I actually mean by by the kind of things? I mean, the first thing, obviously, we could be here all not just all evening, all week, all month, talking about the, the solutions. But I think um, we need to first acknowledge some of the uh, uh, hardships that are being faced by people across uh, Europe because mm -hmm. as a result of the action that many of the governments have taken in cutting back on some pretty essential services that people rely on. Uh, that's something obviously we've seen under this government in the UK uh, using the crisis, the economic crisis as the pretext to do that, but we're seeing it obviously in other uh, countries across uh, Europe as well. Um, there are some, um, some, some uh, uh, not, not wholesale solutions because this is something that will take years and decades uh, to, to solve. But we have to at least recognise the, the, the need to do it. For instance, this morning you would have heard that uh, the Labour Party uh, has taken the decision to link the national minimum wage to earnings. And this is a, a very important step um, that means that obviously as people's incomes uh, increase more generally in the wider economy, uh, we also take um, those who are on the lowest uh, pay uh, uh, with that trajectory. Now, I know that won't solve the issue by any means, no. but it's a very important step. Um, when it comes to tax avoidance by multinational companies, which is endemic across the European Union, I think, again, we need to take cross-border action and work with, uh, uh, work with the European institutions to help combat that. And I think key, and this is one of the reasons why I'm extremely passionate about our ability as a labor movement to uh, effect change in Europe, is how we improve the conditions for young people. Because yes. we hear an awful lot about the economy growing, about us coming out of the recession, when in actual fact, the shocking statistic is that, that, that nearly one in five, one in five young people who are unemployed in, in, in the European Union are unemployed in the UK. So youth unemployment is a huge issue, and I think action on, for example, jobs, pathways into work, the European Youth Guarantee is an excellent example of the kind of initiative that the Labour Party focused through, which, incidentally, the current government is not using the funds for. Uh, um, housing, issues on rent, rent uh, costs and things like that, all of those are part of a much bigger picture, and I think you're seeing an agenda now emerging from the Labour Party that is looking at inequality as the core problem that we need to tackle going forward. Um, when it comes to companies uh, and climate change, I'm going to take these two together if that's all the right time. I know, I know, I know I'm taking all the time. Um, climate change, uh, I actually feel that we can actually work with some companies um, when it comes to climate change. If you think about um, some issues that, that companies need to base their, um, their, their business models on, they know that uh, if, if consumers uh, choose uh, rivals or if they are um, uh, look, uh, tend to move away from particular um, uh, companies because of their practices when it comes to tax avoidance, Starbucks being one example, Amazon being another. I think climate change has the potential to be another issue that we can actually work with uh, private companies on. So I don't think that they are 
uh, necessarily part of the problem, but you're absolutely right. If you have um, uh, public oversight removed completely, that things are only driven in the interest of commercial profit, then you can never solve issues like climate change because that commercial interest will always trump the public interest. And as far as uh, uh, the primary job of, uh, of politicians, of government, and of course of the EU, to ensure that that doesn't happen. I'll ask come, come to see that again, because then I'll come in towards our final vote. Yeah. Uh, Jackie, on, on um, climate change and environmental issues, um, I think I can be quite proud of the work that uh, Ed Davey, the climate change secretary, and before him, Chris Hume, have done within the coalition government. It's not always easy, particularly in, in the current economic climate, some of the pressure from our partners has... Uh, has uh, trying to clip some of the wings on that. So you can be assured that both nationally Lib Dems are very active in that and, and the European Parliament or the MEPs of the North West, Chris Davis, has been at the forefront of European aspects of that and I think we've got to really ensure that the European Union continues to be a pace setter for the world on these issues and does not uh, backtrack on it. Um, John from Romney, I, I I'm also uh, the Quaker, I used to be a councillor in Bromley, just so that the Quaker is <coughs> on church as well. Um, and I agree absolutely, on, of course, on, on the essential need <coughs> to reduce wealth inequality. I think it's helpful to us, for us to remember that one of the founding principles, core principles of the European Union, was to reduce the gap between rich and poor, particularly rich and poor regions. And for many years, it was doing rather well at that. I mean, look at what happened to Ireland, for example, after it joined the European Union. But the financial crisis and development since 2008 have not that off course. We've got to get it back on course. And certainly, if I am elected on Thursday, and if TTP, TTIP doesn't go through, in your hypothesis, then indeed I would be very happy to then concentrate more on that aspect of how we can reinvigorate the European process of reducing inequality. Okay, well, I, I'll take the second one first. I mean, you won't be surprised to hear that, um, you know, the Greens that the environment is extremely important for us. And therefore, the, the issue about the toughest possible regulations that we can have there um, to work <coughs> with, um, there are progressive companies out there that are trying to push a lot more of renewables, energy efficiency, um, resource efficiency, those sort of things, obviously, you know, that, that's the, the direction in, in which we want to go. And certainly, you know, in terms of what was being said about EU leadership on climate change, you know, that really is, I think, in the balance at the moment. And it's becoming a tougher and tougher struggle certainly even in this parliament, let alone you know, when we look at the prospects sort of for the next one, to actually win anything particularly ambitious, I think, on climate change. And therefore, you, you know, who's in that next European parliament really, really matters. Because you, you know, this is something we don't mess around with, and I wish people would take you pick on a bit more on, on this. But then the media is not allowing us to talk about the election, but those are the issues. In terms of what we do um, in, uh, in reducing the, the gap between rich and poor, I think there's a lot that can be done at the European Union level, um, albeit you know, setting minimum wage or whatever is, is not a competence there. Tackling tax havens is one. I believe the financial transaction tax is another. Corporate taxation, actually making companies pay the tax that they're supposed to pay, and therefore at least having a base level across the European Union under which then, you know, so to try and reduce that tax Positive, completely anti-discrimination legislation will make it work. Strengthen the role of social partners, in particular trade unions. There's a whole set of things on the uh, financial side. Bank of bonuses was one. The proposal from my group that was what we could get. Ideally, we want a pay ratio. So, you know, and that was what we went for. We went for a 20 to 1 pay ratio. We couldn't win that. Too much. We, I know it's yeah. too much. Way too we, much. Yeah. Yeah. We couldn't win a 20 to 1 pay ratio in the European Parliament. <laughs> Our current policy is 10 to 1. We couldn't do that. So there's a whole set of other things, but the chair is getting nervous. Well, to, uh, to, uh, on the inequality point, 
uh, first. Uh, well, to lift the, uh, the poor out of poverty, the best thing we can do is, is to grow our economy overall and increase mm. the overall productivity. Oh. Oh. I will tell you that, that there used to be a set of countries not too far away to the east of us that did prioritize inequality. In the no of, <laughs> and what, what they ended up achieving was neither equality nor prosperity and losing that freedom in the process as well. So I don't think it is something that, that I want to prioritize about raising the, the prosperity of everyone in this society. Uh, but on the, uh, th there are specific measures, however, that we have been taking uh, that, that do help the, those on low incomes, for example, raising the minimum wage. And, and, and lowering tax and taking lots of people out of tax as well. And, and, and those are, are, are things that I think actually have been uh, immensely beneficial for, for many on low incomes and will, and will no doubt continue to be so. Um, as regards the uh, global warming thing, um, well, we have been committed to uh, the 40% reduction in emissions by 2030. And I think that uh, we would continue to be committed to uh, further targets that would seek to, to keep us within that two degree limit that the scientists tell us is, is most important on that. Uh, on the uh, uh, corporation, well, I, I think there's a slight you know, misunderstanding here in the sense that uh, this free trade deal, it's not just meant for big corporations, it's meant for companies of all different sizes. <laughs> Many of those that will benefit from it are small and medium-sized businesses really? that currently mm, have to have a ton of compliance costs. Falling up. <laughs> that they turn, they currently have to have a ton of compliance costs. It's not the big companies that worry about these costs because for them it's a small fraction of their total, you know, in the, in the great sea of profit that they drop in the ocean. It's the small companies that actually suffer the most from over-regulation and from uh, the duplication of regulation that there is across the Atlantic at the minute. I think that those would be the most likely to benefit from uh, the trade deal. So it's the, it's the little guy rather than the big guy that benefits. Thanks very much. Now, I want to come to the final, final vote on TTIP. And this is the vote which is going to ask all of the candidates in and Mr. President. If, if we get no ISDF, so ISDF is out of TTIP, hell is out of TTIP, and there's no threat to introduce. In Peter. Are we for or against Peter?